Okay, good morning. Uh, our next speaker is also local. Uh, Dr. Shahrazad Sadiq Nazari is a associate professor at the Department of Pathology in the School of Medicine, and her topic is use of immune systems bare essentials in identifying autoimmune CD4 T cell targets. Shahrazad. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for having, uh, inviting me as a speaker, and I'm particularly honored to be in the same session talking with Dr. Paul. <laughs> and as some of you may know, I, I have been trained in LI, laboratory of immunology, uh, with Ron Germain, and um, then that's when Dr. Paul was uh, our chair, and we all had the privilege and the honor to be uh, in the same uh, meetings and uh, lectures and seminars and all that wonderful and got feedback from him and so I hope I won't disappoint him now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on a hot spot now. <laughs> all right, so today's talk is going to be uh, about uh, new um, technology that we have developed in the lab and how that can relate to autoimmune um, diseases and potentially and how it can solve problems which has to do with antigen processing and presentation. Uh, so <clears throat> as um, many, everyone here probably knows, is uh, immune, uh, autoimmune diseases, the, uh, mainly uh, what you want to do in autoimmune disease is that uh, to target T cells that are specific for uh, the epitopes from self-antigen. Because these are the epitopes that um, cause damage to tissues, and um, oftentimes the process of treating autoimmune diseases is nonspecific, so some kind of a, uh, immune suppressants are being uh, pumped into the patients to suppress basically all the immune system, which is not good. And therefore, it's important to uh, be able to identify real targets in autoimmune diseases and um, destroy them. So uh, how do we fit in here? Um, and these are because we have developed some technologies and uh, tools that can uh, address um, autoimmune diseases in principle. And mainly, it's a reductionist antigen processing system that successfully identifies immunodominant epitopes from protein antigens. <clears throat> Next is that um, we have learned that T cells that develop and recognize those immunodominant epitopes go on to become long-lived memory T cells. So um, that's very critical uh, when it relates to autoimmunity. Uh, next is that we would, um, using this reductionist system, we can gain some understanding at the mechanistic levels and find out differences in how antigen is processed and for pathogen-derived antigen versus maybe autoimmune-derived antigens. So uh, quickly, for those who may not be exactly tuned to this, um, immunodominance has to do with a very uh, small uh, portion of um, epitopes that are derived from a protein antigen and T cells, some T cells, clonal T cells, would recognize them and respond to that as opposed to many other peptides that can be uh, derived from the same antigen. And for some mysterious reasons, what we gain is that very few among all the possible antigens get recognized and generate these specific uh, responding T cells. And, um, well, it's an important thing to understand what a, a, a dominant epitope is, because that's the key of targeting and going after those T cells. So, um, and however, there are methods that currently are being used, uh, mainly is basically a, a scanning method of thousands or hundreds of overlapping peptides, uh, which uh, through T cells that have been primed to them, presumably, and or computer-based prediction um, technologies that are based on structural qualities of the um, uh, MAC uh, molecules based on crystal structures and others and uh, characteristics of peptides that fit in. But the problem with both methods is that oftentimes they are extremely labor-intensive, in 
the overlooked post-translational post modifications that uh, dominant epitope may have, and that happens a lot, especially in autoimmune diseases. And they, um, oftentimes, they are better for MAC class one epitopes, although not very good. Uh, for MAC class two, they totally are not very useful. And um, importantly, they produce uh, much of false positive or false negative results. And that's because they don't take into consideration steps that are involved in antigen processing. And just to remind you of the complexity of antigen processing system, uh, I'm just pointing out here quickly that exogenous antigen, this is MAC class two processing pathway, uh, exogenous antigen go from outside, find their way through early endosome to late endosome where um, M2C is, and there, there you have all the components of antigen processing that includes uh, proteases, catapsins, and um, they also include HLA-DM. And uh, once this uh, editing by DM occurs, the uh, right peptide gets selected, presumably, and goes back and uh, st uh, stimulates helper T cells. So um, because of the involvement of DM, we have been working on DM for many years. And so we felt that we know something about DM. And uh, what we know about DM is that it it recognized basically different conformations that are induced upon binding uh, of MAC molecule to different kind of peptides. So some pep depending on what kind of peptide MAC binds to, it changes in its conformation into a um, more closed versus into an open conformation. If the conformation is open, the M here shown in orange and green can uh, knock down, recognize this conformation, and knock down that peptide which is not proper and make it into a conformation which is receptive and can rebind to another peptide. When a good peptide binds, then DM leaves it alone, doesn't recognize anymore, and we have a closed conformation with this peptide which is the right peptide and fits in. So the question is, is that peptide the immunodominant epitope? And so we thought that let's try and form a reductionist antigen processing system, which a key player would be DM. And that is what has been missing from all these efforts in identification of immunodominant epitopes. So um, this is the result of many years of work uh, done heroically by uh, Isamu Hartman and followed uh, af uh, after the early part uh, by uh, Arian Kim, and who is here. And we have. Um, so basically, we're starting with a protein antigen with soluble HLA-DR1 at HLA-DM and uh, add in uh, catapsins B and H that are exoproteases. And each one would chop up uh, individual amino acids from right or left. And then we have catapsin S, which will cut the uh, protein from the middle some places. And it's, a, it's known that it's a significant, it has a significant role in antigen processing compartments. And we um, provided acidic pH, which is how it is in uh, endosomal compartments, and reducing conditions for the denaturation of the protein. We tested the system against two, no, uh, two antigens with the known uh, immunodominant epitopes, collagen 2 and influenza from Texas 77, uh, HA1 of uh, influenza and worked out and tuned the system, and then we applied that to unknown antigen de novo uh, antigens where immunodominant epitopes were not known. And these two, these are two samples, examples. So we mix the whole thing together and allow for processing and uh, binding of the right epitope and selection uh, to uh, HLA-DR1. We immunoprecipitate DR1, elute the peptides, and identify their sequences by mass spectrometry. So um, this was the, this is the result, uh, just as an example of the success of the uh, technology. Uh, we have used, this is H5N1 from avian flu at the time, uh, was very uh, threatening. And uh, we used this, and uh, we found, interestingly enough, a single epitope was found from, uh, actually there are two peptides, but they are the exactly same one, this was has an extension. So we found one uh, peptide, and this 
came out through either if the antigen was not fully denatured by boiling or it was boiled. And uh, this is the background. So this is basically, you're going to see a lot of this type of uh, slides. It's a mass spec um, analysis. Each peak is shown as immunodominant. Usually they are shown by red. And uh, so what we found was that by system, we found this as the sole um, peptide that was selected by the system. So we synthesized that peptide and then tested it in T cell proliferation and uh, gamma interferon production. And as you can see, I would not have shown you uh, these if it didn't work. So here, actually, the peptide did better than the protein. So this was quite uh, effective uh, inducer of the clonal activation. And now then, the question was, one of the reviewers asked us, does, uh, does this epitope recognize, the epitope that you have identified, does, can it be um, recognized through viral, if you injected virus or virion or vaccine of H5N1, does that work also? And the answer is yes. <coughs> so here is um, just showing that when we injected mice with the vaccine, which is a whole virus, inactivated virus of H5N1, and uh, came back and pulled out their uh, deraining lymph nodes and tested them against um, H, uh, the same epitope that we found using uh, the tetramer uh, loaded uh, peptide, uh, tetramers that were loaded, actually the R1 tetramers that included this peptide compared to clip peptide, um, or this is the negative control where we did not inject a protein. So we found a significant increase in um, the specific tetramer specific T cells that recognize uh, this particular epitope. That is cells that are directly isolated from mice. And those of you who have done tetramer uh, assays, you know that it's usually very difficult to find cells directly out of the mouse. Usually you uh, need to stimulate cells for a week or more before you can enrich cells for the specific cells, which we did here. And we stimulated further down. And uh, importantly, the stimulation is not with the peptide. Stimulation is with the protein. And therefore, there's another secondary processing involved during this uh, extended um, incubation time of eight days or longer that, again, it selects for that particular epitope. And so you can see that the T cells are uh, much more uh, here. Uh, when the stimulation was done with proteins. And with vaccine stimulation, it's not as good, but um, it's significant. And these are the backgrounds. So then the next question is, all right, what about the memory cells? Yes, the, uh, we, in, we injected mice with these uh, virion and then waited for a long time, four months. So this is a real, I don't know a lot of people who do memory experiments within months worth of time. In fact, um, we have done these experiments. And um, to our gratification, we found that um, if the virion was injected together with CPG in order not to introduce any additional antigen, but just as an adjuvant, and four months later came an isolated cells from mice, uh, these are directly coming out of mice. And looking at the H5N1 tetramer positive cells versus t uh, memory marker CD44, we found that majority of CD44 high cells being memory, long-term memory, they, they were tetramer positive. This is quite a significant uh, percent of positive cells. And if, if we gated on this population and then look for CD127, another um, characteristic of memory T cells, we found that pretty much 100% of them 127 positive. So we were very happy with these results. And um, when we uh, put them in culture for another eight days or so, we did not, we did not see any reduction. Instead, we saw uh, even better uh, positivity here. And, um, and that is because in vitro protein stimulation did not increase anything since we think that long-term memory cells do not just become violently uh, uh, responding and proliferating unless there is a good reason for which is a second signal or uh, danger signals around. 
So having this, we are very confident that our uh, technology works and is applicable to memory T cells. Then we went to um, one more antigen from uh, malaria, LSA uh, liver stage antigen, uh, which was a recombinant form made in Walter Reed. And uh, we set up a collaboration and we used their antigen uh, for in our system. And again, I'd like to point uh, your attention to the red peptide here, which we identified as immunodominant. And that is different from the background without antigen. And it also showed similar responses positive to in proliferation. It, it, it brought the clonal population to proliferate to that and made IL-2, whereas all the other overlapping peptides, which was very close to that immunodominant epitope, did not do anything. And importantly, uh, we got into a collaboration with a human trial in vaccine which uh, these, there were a group of volunteers who had been immunized to this uh, potential, the protein as potential vaccine to protect from um, malaria. And these individuals, they had eight of these people who had responded to protein, but they had not uh, found any responsiveness to any of the peptides that uh, they had used uh, overlapping library. And so what we did was that we used uh, cells from those eight individuals without knowing their HLA and tested them against the antigen that we found. And lo and behold, we found two individuals responded. And when we sent their cells for HLA typing, turned out those two were the only HLA DR1 uh, containing or expressing individuals. And that was extremely happy uh, moment for all of us. So then we felt that, um, yes, so it seems that the system works even in human. So the um, question is, so, so far, what we are learning is that a minimal number of um, components of antigen processing is sufficient to identify immunodominant epitopes. And then the question is, what, can, what, can, what more can we learn about the antigen processing using the system. The system is very, is a reductionist. It has very few components. So it's very easy to uh, stepwise dissect different aspects of um, antigen processing. So um, in, in this slide, which is quite a busy slide, but all you would need to know is that the idea here is that because of the simplicity of the system, we looked at the temporal, uh, uh, spatial temporal relationship between the, um, at what stage antigen should be processed and at what stage it should be edited. And originally, as everyone thinks, we thought that we have to cut the protein into small pieces and then add DM and do the um, evaluation of the, um, editing. Uh, however, it turned out completely the opposite. And it turned out that if we subjected our protein three hours or one hour or even 15 minutes to pre-digestion with the catapsins that we had in the system, what happened was that we could not find the dominant epitope anymore. The dominant epitope was gone even 15 minutes of pre-digestion. However, if we came the opposite direction, if we, if we came and incubated the protein with the M and the R molecules first, and then we added the catapsins, we could see uh, perfectly um, identifiable dominant epitopes. So this was quite a difference from what we had in mind and what is in textbooks. So um, when, then we tested this with another antigen, H5N1, and similar, again, the same idea happened. And with malaria, the same. So it seemed that um, the system is really, uh, the antigen has to bind to MHC molecule first and perhaps be edited at that stage and then um, become uh, selected. So therefore, if that is the case, the antigen has to bind to MHC molecule as a whole protein. So here is we are testing the binding of the whole full length protein to the HLA molecules and here is a gel showing that different individual steps. But uh, what you would want to see is that if we had DR1, 
with the protein, you have a new band here, which uh, becomes intensified when DM is around. And now this band goes away if you have a competitor peptide which binds to the groove of DR1 very stably. And if you do have this band goes away and instead a new band appears, which is here, and that shows the complex of uh, this peptide with the DR1. And this, this assay is a gentle SDS assay where uh, we don't boil the samples, therefore the um, primary complex can be seen migrating slower on the gel. And if you are not, uh, to, to prove that um, this was actually full length protein, we did this very, this was a very complicated uh, Western to accomplish by Arian. And uh, the idea here is that uh, we have different uh, sets of, uh, samples, non-boiled or boiled, to show that what exactly uh, is composed of. When they are non-boiled, uh, you can see the complexes formed. And here is non-boiled, but we are staining with anti-his antibody, which would recognize the protein antigen. Here we are staining with anti-DR um, antiserum, so that we would know where the complexes between the protein and the DR is located. And here, when you have DR1 and HA, uh, recombinant HA, you would see a new band. In the D when DM is around, it becomes more. And when, again, when you compete with the high, uh, with a peptide, <coughs> which binds to the groove, this band goes away, and you have only uh, the, the, the HLA uh, migrates as dimers here. So uh, it shows that actually, really, a full length protein binds to. Um, the DR molecules first. And so the summary points here are that immunodominant epitopes from antigens are susceptible to destruction by processing enzymes, catapsin B, S, and H. And um, that has to be done, unlike the common belief, the binding comes first and then trimming or uh, cutting. So what about the role of DM? So here is the role for DM. Uh, when we compared, so what we learned from the experiments I had shown earlier was that in the presence of DM versus the absence of DM, we actually could find a trace of the um, immunodominant epitope in the absence of DM. In the presence of DM, that would become more. And then when we quantitated the two, turned out that uh, DM causes an enhancement or increases the abundance of the immunodominant epitopes. And when it was uh, more accurately quantified, it turned out somewhere about fivefold at least increase in the um, immunodominant epitope compared when DM was around. So how does DM do that? Uh, when we looked at the kinetics of dissociation of the immunodominant epitopes from DR1 under different, uh, for different antigens, all of them showed that they were not DM sensitive. It means DM could not dislodge these peptides from the groove. And uh, so, so far, what we had learned is that DM is critical for selection of immunodominant epitope, and it increases abundance of uh, the immunodominant epitope, which is more or less like chemical dominance. And uh, immunodominant epitopes are resistant to DM-mediated dissociation. So then the next question is, so um, what, can we, what can we learn more about the antigen processing and autoimmunity? And what, what do we know about the, um, how does this relate to autoimmune diseases and about processing for autoimmune diseases? So we are quickly going through another antigen, which, is, which you all know, and it has been, uh, is type 2 collagen, uh, which is a, um, a target uh, of uh, an arthritis, model arthritis in mice. So we thought that would give a try using our system, collagen to arthritis. And here, just quickly, uh, we found the immunodominant epitope from collagen 2, which has been previously identified. We used the system and we found it again. And in addition to the um, immunodominant epitope here, we found a second antigen, which you could find it only in the absence of DM. But something was curious uh, about processing 
of uh, class two, uh, of collagen here. It turns out that um, the immunodominant epitope of collagen in red, uh, they were not susceptible to um, either DM or uh, catopsins alone. You could only find these, they, they were prevalent and at the, at the expense of the other epitopes that we could find as DM, as uh, sort of non-dominant, uh, when we had both DM and catopsins in place. So there was, a, um, there was something different about this particular, the collagen processing. So then we thought that let's uh, look at the uh, dissociation rates of the peptides that we found. This is a the, uh, this one is one of these um, the uh, which we thought originally it was DM sensitive peptides and uh, looked at this dissociation and here is looking at the complexes starting at 100% uh, of looking at this dissociation it's although it's biphasic but roughly the half time is 13 hours in the absence of DM and when you add DM it basically is DM knocks it out right away it's very very quickly dissociate. So we thought, fine, that's good. But then the surprising thing was that when we, would win, we went to the immunodominant epitope, we found that the same is true here. While the, in the absence of DM, the peptide was really stable, 90 hours. In the presence of DM, it was knocked down and uh, very quickly, and it became, in half an hour, the dissociation, um, the half time was about half an hour. So it turned out that this is also DM sensitive. And so then how could you uh, put the whole thing together? Uh, what Arian did was that ran this uh, complex, uh, which is basically the same uh, test that we have been doing, the, the system, using uh, now synthetic peptide she incubated uh, for one hour in the presence of um, catopsins and then allowed them to bind to DR in the presence of DM, then eluded peptides, and then looked for uh, identity to find them in, uh, by mass spectrometry. And she did that for collagen antigen and for HA uh, antigen, uh, uh, and to another antigen that uh, we knew that it wasn't sensitive. So what she found was that, surprisingly, the HA peptide, which is coming from flu, it was very sensitive to uh, being degraded by the enzymes in the system, whereas the collagen antigen was not. So the collagen antigen was not sensitive. It was sensitive to DM, but was not sensitive to uh, the uh, proteases. So what we think, what happens is that, so we did that for all the antigens that were from infectious um, the different viruses that we had tested, or malaria, and they were all sensitive to catapsins, and they were resistant to DM-mediated dissociation. And when we did the same for collagen antigen, is DM-sensitive and resistant to catapsins. And uh, so we thought that, is that a general trend? Maybe we can find some ex more examples from the literature. And MVP, uh, different antigens, uh, <coughs> peptides from MBP, uh, myelin basic protein or GAD or gliadin um, residues. They, some of them uh, have been, uh, you can find information about their DM sensitivity and they are DM sensitive. And when you go to catapsin sensitivity, we don't have information on them, but in this case, it's resistant to um, protease, uh, proteases. So it seems that putting the whole thing together, we think this is how it works. Uh, the antigen processing, uh, it, it works by, here we have two different peptides, one which doesn't bind very well, one which binds uh, extremely well, and is DM resistant. And um, these antigens, if you, uh, they are, uh, some, sometimes they are catapsin and HLA-DM. Uh, when both of them are around, what happens is that uh, DM re removes, this is red is DM. So what DM does, when a peptide, which is not the right peptide, doesn't have the best confirmation, uh, uh, so DM would edit it, basically, would kick it out of place, 
And because there are catepsins, catepsin can chew those. And this one, this antigen, which is binding well and is DM insensitive, it stays bound. And so by the fact that these other peptides go out of the equation, you remove and enrich for the DM uh, insensitive peptides. And sometimes if a, the, a peptide is DM sensitive, but catepsin insensitive, it can come back. It comes off, but catepsin cannot co destroy them. So it comes back and rebinds. And therefore, the bottom line at the end is that it gains dominance again, uh, by, because of a different mechanism. So uh, our experiments so, so far suggest that uh, antigens that come from outside from pathogens, it seems that they are more characteristic is that they're all sensitive to catepsins and they uh, are uh, insensitive to DM dissociation. But maybe other antigens that are, we are supposed to be tolerized to and they have been around, uh, maybe food antigens or autoimmune antigens, they may have different properties. And maybe that's part of the reason they may have even escaped uh, deletion in the thymus. So this is uh, the general uh, conclusions. I think I went, I hope I'm not too late, but uh, we have found a cell-free antigen processing system that uh, reveals temporal relationship between antigen capture and proteolytic digestion of the protein <coughs> antigens. The M, catepsin B, H, and S are critical in selection of dominant epitopes. T cells specific to immune dominant epitopes uh, become long-term memory. Selected epitopes are protected by the groove of MAC class two from being digested, um, and we've shown that for several antigens. It's also possible that dominant epitopes are sensitive to DM and resistant to catepsin digestion. So in either case, the immune dominant epitopes gain dominance by as a chemical dominance, and um, those that are not dominant are digested away. And uh, at the end, most importantly, I'd like to thank my colleagues. Um, thank you very much, and I take questions. Yes. Herazard, one thing which is so striking, um, Immunodominance, then, is a property of the interaction of a peptide and the class II molecule, and not necessarily a competition between different peptides. You said one time we used to think the immunodominant peptide prevented the other guys from getting going. Oh. So if your view is it's a property of these cells, then the second striking thing was that in the H5N1 story, there was one peptide. Yes. Why didn't the, uh, the influenza mutate that peptide to make it non-dominant and therefore escape the immune response? Well, in this particular strain and the protein that we have used on that variant uh, is what it is. But maybe when time comes by and a new strain, they may change. No, I understand. Um, but w would you not anticipate if there are so few I peptides that meet the test that therefore there'd be a high premium on the part of a pathogen to mutate so that they had no peptides and therefore would escape the immune response completely. Yes, that's a good point, but I have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we find. All right, so one more question. Come on. That's a very nice system that you have. So I would just want to make a comment that Oh, many times we come across epitopes that are really very poor binders when you do in vitro assays to MHCs, but those were done not like your refined way, but simple MHC binding, in vitro binding, but still they are really very immunodominant in vivo. So maybe we can refer to this initially as a biochemical immunodominance because the T cell repertoire is the second part that would really determine how big the response to that peptide is. Yes. I'd like to address this because the general uh, thinking in the field is that DM selects for the best binders. It's not true. DM selects for peptides that fit in the P1 pocket and basically change the conformation in a way that they were no longer recognizable by DM. It's not necessarily the dissociation rate. Although everyone says what DM does is selects for the best binder as far as it relates to dissociation rate, so it select for stability. 
we have shown that it's not the case. It's the, the conformation of the complex that is formed and how it makes it to be recognized by DM or not. And that's a real key point that um, we are raising and it, we, we show that clearly that's, that's what's happening. So it's possible that those peptides, they may not be the bond you're talking about. They may not induce that, uh, they do induce a conformation that is CDM uh, resistant, but they may not be very long lived peptides. All right, I, I think we have to move on now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So our final speaker for the morning program is uh, a local colleague from across the city at the University of Maryland, and it is Dr. Martin Flymeck, who is a professor okay. yeah. of um, microbiology and immunology at the School of Medicine at the okay. University of Maryland. And his talk is The Evolutionary History of Innate and Conventional B-Cells. Thanks, Bruce. Space Cowboy. Thanks. Oh, thanks very much for um, the invitation. And I just want to say thanks, especially to Noel. I think he might be the last scholar in Baltimore. Uh, <laughs> And um, that's a sad case, uh, but uh, hopefully he'll get some of us, <laughs> some others of us to be scholars too. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is basically the evolution of um, gamma delta cells and uh, innate B cells or, or B1 cells. And I picked this topic because those are thought to be the most inherently self-reactive cells in the body. Um, interacting, uh, it's been shown for years that they interact with self molecules. And what I want to do is tell you that uh, I'd like to set up a new paradigm uh, on uh, the based on the evolution of gamma delta cells, that um, they're not all innate like you think, at least that's what I, I think, and that um, this uh, natural antibody system probably goes all the way back to the beginning of, of adaptive immunity. And this picture shows you uh, the vertebrates, running the jawed vertebrates, the sharks, the teleos fish, amphibians, birds, mammals, these are the animals that have adaptive immunity based on IgTCR MHC. This is a jawless vertebrate, I'll show you in a second. Um, and these, these are the animals we'll be talking about throughout the lecture today. And uh, these are the folks whom uh, I've collaborated with. The, these first six are folks in my lab now. The ones underlying Caitlin Castro and Yuko Ota. Um, I'll talk about um, their work the most today. And uh, collaborators from the outside, Greg Silverman and Zuli Parr and Rob Miller from University of New Mexico. This paper came out in Nature Immunology a couple of years ago by Gary Littman and uh, Max Cooper. I think probably all of you know Max Cooper. Uh, He's a god of immunology, or, or at least a demigod, I'd have to say. And um, at least uh, for the comparative field, and, and for, for actually for all immunologists, his work was seminal in the chicken, telling us uh, that there were T cells and B cells. He did uh, work in the early days on the bursa of Fabricius, um, figuring out that that was an organ specific for, for B cell differentiation. And the same guy, 45 years later, has now described an entirely new adaptive immune system in the jawless vertebrates, uh, the lamprey and the hagfish. So if you see his name on the paper, it's not his son. It's actually him uh, who, who did the work. You know, It's kind of like if George Romney were running for president now. But that's how uh, much he's done in his career, all, all of these seminal findings. The other fellow here, Gary Littman, he is uh, you may not know him, but he's, to us, comparative people, he's Susumu Tonagawa. Um, 
He's the one that brought molecular biology into, into the comparative field. Both of them are protégés of Robert Good, who uh, was a real pioneer in um, cellular immunology. And I think he's got the most publications of any immunologist uh, in, in the history, history of the field. Oops, one other thing I wanted to say. Um, I'm just going to be talking mainly again about B1 cells and, and gamma delta cells, but uh, what we like to do in comparative immunology is something that the fly people did. That's uh, Lemaitre and um, Hoffman. Their discovery of the toll receptor in, in the mid-90s opened up a whole new field, and I think probably every student in here has probably done something with a toll receptor, and as you well know, they won the, um, at, least, at least Hoffman. Uh, was a co-recipient of, no recipient of the Nobel Prize. So uh, again, uh, talk about general evolution of immunity, a new paradigm for, for gamma delta cells, and um, then talk about uh, natural antibodies for the rest of the, rest of the talk. Um, this is, a, a, again, a phylogenetic tree of deuterostomes. So these are, the, these are the vertebrates, jawed vertebrates in blue that have adaptive immunity based on T cells, B cells, and, and MHC. Um, the, the green ones here are the jawless fish, and they have an adaptive immune system based on this entirely convergent system. Uh, also, uh, like the toll receptor, it's based on leucine rich repeats. We won't talk about this today, but uh, Max and, and Zev Panzer, a, a fellow Baltimorean, have been studying this. Their, their co discoverers have been studying this for, for the past six years. These invertebrates here in pink are re related to us in, in, their, in their embryology. They don't have an adaptive immune system, but they can have a really complex innate immune system to the point where they'd love to have adaptive immunity if they could do it, but they can't. They don't have clonal selection, uh, and they don't have memory, basically because they don't have enough lymphocytes uh, to, to carry them out. The jawed vertebrates, starting with the sharks here, not only have uh, an immune system like human, T TCR, BCR, MHC, but they also have, uh, from the beginning, these intense cytokine, chemokine networks like uh, Dr. Paul and Dr. Bream talked to you about uh, earlier. So uh, let's start with an adaptive antibody. This is uh, uh, an antibody that, that um, my lab discovered in, in the 90s. So sharks have uh, IgM, and we'll talk about this in the second part of the talk. Another isotype called IgW, and then this antibody called IgNAR, which is a dimer of heavy chains that isn't associated with light chains. And uh, it has these single V uh, domains. Um, and these are electron micrographs that I purified the protein and sent to Ken Ru. Um, Ken Ru is uh, uh, the world leader in making these types of EMs of immune molecules. If you, if you just look in PubMed, you'll see he's done lots of things. This is a typical IgG antibody here, an EM. This is a monoclonal that I made to the tail of, of an IgNAR molecule. So this is a a really uh, highly adaptive molecule. It's encoded by a cluster that has three Ds and a J, so it has to undergo four rearrangement events. And the idea is that it's essentially CDR3 to give it the primary repertoire, very long and diverse CDR3s. And then after the cells come in contact with antigen, uh, they mutate the receptor like crazy. That's, that's the basic idea, a real adaptive molecule. And some of you may know that the camel, camelid family, these are the four species, has a similar type of molecule with a single domain. And the way that they generate that is by alternative splicing of their IgGs. And this has become a famous molecule. They discovered theirs a couple years before we, we found the one in the shark. This is generated by convergent evolution. And um, if you haven't used these single domain Vs, you probably will in the future. There's a big company that, uh, in Belgium. They're, they're really good at getting at epitopes that regular antibodies can't. Uh, they can cross the blood-brain barrier and do a lot of, a lot of interesting things. And uh, we think these have evolved uh, twice like this because these single domain Vs complement regular antibodies. Having a single V like this, and I'll show you crystal structures in a second, probably gives the immune system something different to work with 
uh, in, instead of the planar way of interaction that uh, a regular antibody does. Now what Arsusumo Tonagawa Littman found in the, in the cartilaginous fish, what made him famous, was that the, the sharks, the oldest animals to have it, the adaptive immune system, have their immunoglobulin genes in a cluster type organization. And depending on the species of shark, it can range between 10 to uh, 200 of these clusters. In the shark I work with, there, there are actually very few clusters. And the IgNAR, like I told you, has three Ds, uh, a J and a C, and they undergo rearrangement within a cluster. And now uh, all the crystal structures that have been obtained with the shark, and we did ours in, in collaboration with Robin Stanfield, Ian Wilson, all of them uh, are, are searching for clefts or other regions of, of molecules. For example, these are Henneg lysozyme antigens, where the antibodies can insert their CDR3s, the, the long and diverse CDR3s, into clefts. And in fact, uh, uh, it may be that this is the only way that these single domain antibodies can interact with, with antigens to get a high enough affinity in order to, uh, um, uh, to bind them. And again, we think this is giving you a complement to um, the, the typical type of antibody. So what I really want to talk about is uh, where we uh, find these single domains in, in gamma deltas. And from Janeway, here's an uh, antigen receptor figure, here's antibody, alpha beta T cell receptor, and um, then the poor cousin, the gamma delta T cell receptor doesn't even get any press here, but it looks, it looks much like an alpha beta T cell receptor. Over evolution, alpha beta T cell receptors aren't that interesting, so we concentrated on looking at the, the evolution of gamma delta TCRs. And a postdoc in the lab, Mike Crisitiello, started to look at repertoire and uh, did that by um, uh, uh, five prime race using a, a primer in the, in the C domain. And um, what he ended up with was not only a single band that you would expect with a V and a C for a typical uh, T cell receptor chain, but, but two bands. And uh, for the longest time I told him he just had an artifact and uh, that's usually what you expect for PCR. Uh, but he persisted and it turns out that these uh, delta TCRs are three domain molecules and uh, about 25% of them are. Uh, the other 75% are bona fide uh, delta chains. And the, the domain on top is encoded by something that looks like one of these NARVs that you just saw in the, in the, in the EMs. So uh, the same type of uh, structure, actually, we don't, we don't actually know. We haven't immunoprecipitated this yet to look at the structure, but this is what we predict the T cell receptor will look like. And how it works is uh, the, the T cell receptor loci are in the translocon configuration. So what we think happens somewhere in evolution, and all the cartilaginous fish have this funny type of delta chain. Um, that goes back to 300 million years, all the different types. Uh, one of these NAR-V clusters <coughs> looks like it recombined uh, in a germ cell with the T cell receptor delta locus. And it rearranges within a cluster just like an Ig. And it's upstream of a typical V delta that rearranges to downstream Ds and Js. So that's going to end up giving you a, um, a three-domain molecule where you have two rearrangement events. Uh, actually, we don't know whether it started as a T cell receptor and went to an Ig or the other way around. But what we think is, this is suggesting that just like immunoglobulins, probably uh, uh, gamma delta receptors most likely can recognize free antigen. And it's giving a complementary type of binding structure, a typical gamma delta TCR, and a uh, one with, with a single domain on the top of it. Now, this is a paper, again, this uh, PLOS paper we wrote about convergent evolution of the single domains. And where we find them are in the camelids and, and in the sharks. And in the sharks, we find not only immunoglobulins with the three domain, with a single domain, but also T cell receptors. But, you know, that could have just been some shark-specific stuff. Not that interesting. Uh, a, a year later, in New Mexico, Miller and Parra found that T cell receptor delta chains in these species also have a three-domain molecule. And what they did, actually, they combined a new locus from immunoglobulins and T cell receptor delta and ended up with a similar type of structure that we found in the, um, in the sharks. 
So that's still kind of, you know, curiosa. Who really cares about that? But Zulipara, that was her thesis work on the marsupials, then started to look at the genome projects of all other vertebrates. And lo and behold, in Xenopus, if you look at the alpha delta TCR locus, she found that there were um, VHs in purple as well as V alphas and V deltas. Okay? So no three domain molecules per se, but typical VH type genes. And uh, anybody interested in structure, we can talk about what's the difference between a T cell receptor V and, and an immunoglobulin V. And then uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, you may have heord of these sarcopterygians, the coelacanth and the lungfish that are thought to have given rise to tetrapods. Um, these, the coelacanth was the animal that was supposed to be dead for tens of millions of years, and they found one in South Africa in, in the 30s, and now they find them all throughout the, the Pacific Rim, actually. So obviously people are interested, and they made a genome project. Um, this may be the way you think of sarcopterygians or the, the lobefin fish. Um, from a Gary Larson cartoon, and great moments in evolution. Don't tell Sarah Palin about this. Talk. So what she found at the again at the alpha delta locus is there are a lot of VH elements that can rearrange by uh, inversion with C delta. Another thing that's interesting is when we looked uh, in an old time religion experiment where we have segregation analysis, where we just breed two frogs and then look at the progeny and look at RFLPs. So here's T cell receptor C delta. We found a complete um, uh, segregation, co-segregation with the IgM locus. And on top of that, we found co-segregation with the light chain lambda locus. And that was really exciting to us because it fit with an old model that Lee Hood came up with in immunity based on similarities between T cell receptor beta and T cell receptor delta. He argued that there were uh, originally the two chains of the heterodimer were encoded at, at the same place and then by two on block duplications gave rise to heavy chain light chain, the um, alpha delta locus and, and the beta gamma locus. And from, our, from, from that idea and then looking at the genome projects, it really looks like that's true. And HL and alpha delta locus were actually generated by an on block cis duplication. At least that's, that's our idea right now. So uh, if, we, if we look at where VHs are involved in um, uh, T cell receptors, we're finding them now um, uh, as single domains in the sharks, marsupials, and monotremes. And NVHs in frogs, birds, platypus, and in these lobe fin fishes. So if you look at the phylogenetic tree again, you're finding that the T cell receptor delta locus is essentially an immunoglobulin locus, it's mostly, in, and it's only, missing in, it's only missing in the placental mammals. So this is the basic idea. Uh, single domains and antibodies arose several times in evolution. VH like delta TCR first found as a single domain, but now extended to most vertebrates as a VH. And this suggests, similar to old ideas, Dr. Chen, who actually discovered the T cell receptor delta locus, argued that there would be gamma deltas that would see free antigen. And I'm 99% sure that these are going to be found soon. We've just become so enamored with the innate aspects of the gamma deltas that we've been overlooking that there will be adaptive ones too. And again, it's consistent with this, with this old Lee Hood model of, um, of uh, how the antigens re antigen receptor genes arose in evolution. Now, um, here are two immunological heroes for, for you students. These are the Hertzenbergs, um, L.A., or, or Len Hertzenberg, and L.A., or Lee Hertzenberg. Believe it or not, they've been married for 60 years, and uh, you should read. They have an, a beautiful autobiographical sketch in End Reviews of Immunology a couple of years ago. This picture, Len is famous for pioneering facts, and that's actually what, what he's got this uh, medal for. And Lee is um, famous for discovering the B1 cells. Uh, back in the mid-'80s, she called them the, the Li-1B. In fact, I met her in Basel in 1986. And at that point, she looked very frail. You know, I wanted to wheel her around in a wheelchair. I was worried about her. 
So 25 years later at a BSO meeting, you know, she drinks me under the table and uh, she wanted to get a wheelchair out for me. But anyway, these are two of the heroes of the field. So um, for the last part of the talk, I want to tell you about IgMs, a special type of IgM in cartilaginous fish, IgA and an I IgA equivalent. But first, I want to tell you about someone else's work, jealously. Uh, 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 I think the new Max Cooper of our field, a guy named Oriol Sunye Penn, who's done some really interesting uh, work that, that speak to B1 cells. First thing, uh, Oriol Sunye uh, is a complement biologist, worked with John Lambras. So he was looking at phagocytosis in, in trout, in, in bony fish. And uh, like you would expect when he, when he coats them with, uh, with C3 fragments, neutrophils, and monocytes will, will eat, eat uh, just about anything. But he found that lymphocytes, specifically B cells, are phagocytic as well. And in fact, all cold-blooded animals that he tested, uh, the B cells were phagocytic. So uh, he's a smart guy. So in a paper that was just published a few months ago, what he showed, he looked to see whether this would happen in mammals, and lo and behold, the B1 B cells are capable of phagocytosis as well. It's in JLB, you may not have seen it. Uh, somebody else was doing it at the same time, so they decided to uh, publish back to back. And um, uh, he had the data for a long time, but the, the basic idea is both for beads and for bacteria. The uh, B cells, the B1 cells, the innate type B cells are, are capable of phagocytosis. Now, uh, you also know that B1 B cells are important for at mucosal surfaces. You have the different firewalls, like the mesenteric lymph node, the, the T regs, the mucus, and the secretory IgA, the, the, the dimeric uh, IgA that coats bacteria, as was shown by McPherson at the, uh, at the turn of the millennium. And in these bony fish, they actually have a, an isotype specific to these animals that's called IgT. And it kind of looks like the alpha delta locus. When V's rearrange downstream to mu, the IgT locus disappears. So it looks like there are lineages of B cells that will express IgT or IgM. In, in another Nature Immunology paper that Sunye published, turns out that IgT is the predominant Ig in, in the mucosa. And just like McPherson found in, in year 2000, IgT uh, preferentially coats bacteria and seems to serve as a mucosal firewall and is also involved in antigen-specific responses. So I wish I would have done the work, but they at least let me write the news and views about it. And uh, the, it appears that uh, uh, all of the vertebrates have some type of mucosal immu immunology and a dedicated mucosal immunology using different, different isotypes. And uh, the, evolution, the whole evolution of the secretory component and the J chain, um, this is something that we're going to be studying for years to come. And in fact, many people believe that uh, the, um, the immune system, the adaptive immune system, may have started out of, out of mucosal sites. So uh, Sunye's summary, just like uh, what was done in the, in the Drosophila, maybe, maybe not as significant, but uh, a feature that was found in B cells is phagocytosis would translate into what mammalian B cells do. And this mucosal firewall, which seems to be B1 cell dependent, at least most people think so, is a universal characteristic of vertebrate evolution. So for the last couple minutes, uh, I'm going to concentrate on, on shark antibodies, and specifically IgM antibodies. And uh, you, you may know, uh, I, I guess in these, uh, these types of uh, autoimmune sessions, uh, you've talked about natural antibodies for the last 15 years. And let me just preface this by uh, work that's been done by two people that I really like. Uh, Quing Chen is a, a, um, a uh, protege of Marty Weigert and a protege of mine, Marilyn Diaz at NIEHS. And um, they were able to show that natural antibodies, when they're administered, are able to ameliorate autoimmune diseases like SLE. And Diaz showed uh, that was specifically true when you used IgM from aid negative, uh, aid negative mice. So the only thing that aid can do to a natural antibody is screw it up. And when you keep the natural antibodies as natural as possible, it ameliorates autoimmune disease. 
Uh, they're not the only ones to do these, this type of work. Uh, natural antibodies have been around for a long, long time, and um, uh, uh, obviously um, really important for uh, thinking about them for amelioration of disease. Again, this is the, the cluster type organization. The IgM genes are V, two Ds, and a J. And these are the three types of IgM. There's a typical pentameric form of IgM that we call 19S and a 7S form of IgM. As well, there's an early form of IgM that's uh, generated, uh, that's encoded by a so-called germline join form of, of uh, the immunoglobulin that, I, that I'll show you in a second. In terms of immunization of the sharks, we're able, when we immunize them to an antigen, we get a nice IgNAR response, that single domain antibody. We're able to get a, um, a 7S response. So this kind of looks like an IgG, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's IgM. And we're not able to immunize to get a 19S response. So it looks like there are three types of, uh, three types of antibodies for sure, perhaps three different lineages of B cells. These are neonatal nurse sharks that we uh, delivered by cesarean section. They have these beautiful spots and stripes um, when you take them out. And these animals were being used for MHC studies. And we decided since we had them, we should um, also look at the, their immunoglobulins. And when we did immunoprecipitations with a panel of monoclonals that we had against a bona fide immunoglobulin, and immunoprecipitated, we ended up with something that's 19S. This is the, this is the um, a pentameric form. And uh, when you run it reduced, you get a heavy chain and light chain. But we found in the neonate a new type of immunoglobulin, which was, uh, looked like it was making monomers and dimers under non-reducing conditions. And reducing looked like it had the heavy chain had one domain less. When we label with S35 methionine, epigonal, and spleen, we were able to find a lot of that one and very little of, uh, of, the, of the other immunoglobulins. And Gary Littman, our Tonagawa, found that some of, the, some of these clusters underwent rearrangement in the germline. And in fact, this is one of them. It's a germline joined immunoglobulin gene. And when you do a southern blot with a, a V probe under high stringency conditions, it's a single copy gene when you do different enzymes. Low stringency, this is showing you all the IgM genes here. This looks to be the only one that, that's germline joined. And again, this is a, a northern blot showing you that when you use a probe specific for the neonatal one, it's very high in spleen and in the bone marrow equivalent, whereas the uh, uh, adult form of IgM is in low amounts. And when the, when the animal ages in an adult, you have lots of the, the canonical IgM. Um, We've tried hard, a student in the lab, Hal Neely, to find a transmembrane region for this and um, haven't been able to do it with a variety of techniques. So the basic idea is this is something that the sharks are turning on very early. Their first secretory cells come out in a wave producing this particular type of immunoglobulin. First uh, IgM seen in development taken over by conventional IgM. So this was really nice. and. You know, you can get a PNAS paper out of this as a as an uh, a, a early antibody, but what do you do next? And obviously, next you want to find out what it binds to. And we did work with uh, Anthony Rosen, but you know he's two miles away, and it was difficult to get the collaboration going. So I went to San Diego uh, <laughs> with Greg Silverman, who's Mr. Natural Antibody. Actually, he's at NYU now. And that's always fun to get out of the lab, right, and actually do experiments uh, 3,000 miles away. But everything worked out really well. When we took neonatal serum, and I made a monoclonal antibody specific just for the neonatal Ig, we were able to find that it bound to uh, apoptotic thymocytes. And that was really exciting. This is negative control here with, with adult serum. And Greg has made a microarray analysis where um, uh, he's put on these on these uh, microarrays, um, you know, uh, oxidized lipid, uh, PC, MDA, um, and then uh, uh, antigens that are involved in autoimmunity, single strand DNA, double strand DNA, etc. And he, he obviously prints them in duplicates here, and um, so we used our, our shark antibody, 
and we were able to find the neonatal antibody bound to some specific things and the and the 19S antibody bound to lots of different things. This is always the bane of looking at natural antibodies, but the neonatal was fantastic, but it didn't bind to PC, MDA, or oxidized lipid. In fact, it bound to laminin, um, which is an extracellular matrix protein found in endothelia. And uh, I'll just tell you now, this is, this is human laminin. We're not sure if, if, if shark laminin will. We have to purify that and see whether, whether that's true. And the other bane of natural antibodies is if they're ameliorating something like SLE, one would think they're cleaning up uh, d debris or they're binding to tissues and preventing uh, bad antibodies from binding. So um, uh, the student in the lab said, you know, can we actually see this antibody binding somewhere in the shark? And we looked at places like you would expect, like the gut and the, and the gill that would be exposed to, um, one would think, to pathogens. And so this is just taking mouse monoclonal antibodies now. So this is LK14, specific for the kappa chain, which will see all immunoglobulin, the neonatal and, and the regular. Here's one that would just see CB5, just IgM. And here's one that just sees the neonatal antibody. And lo and behold, we were able to find that the neonatal antibody was specifically binding to these channels within the gill, um, which was... Uh, I mean, I, totally unexpected, and, and, but really interesting. And in the gill, and all fish have these endothelial cells that uh, will, will cover the gill surface like this. And it appears that the antibodies binding here as well as to, mother, to some other sites within the, within the shark. Um, so uh, very, very exciting work. So IgM1GJ, it's invariant expressed in an early wave of plasma cells. It binds to mice apoptotic cells by fax, laminin by microarray in ELISA, so that might be why it's binding in those, uh, to the endothelial cells. Uh, laminin inhibits apoptotic cell binding and associates with some other uh, structures as well that, that we have to figure out. Now, um, in, in the, uh, since, since we're running out of time, I'm not going to tell you about um, the last work that we've done, but just want to say that we also see that the J-chain seems to be a really important molecule in not only uh, determining whether uh, uh, the shark immunoglobulin will form a 19S or a 7S, but it also seems it may be a lineage marker telling us what types of cells are innate versus adaptive. Because when you look at, at an adult shark here, at the neonatal shark, these are plasma cells that we find throughout the spleen. So here's the neonatal one. And you have very little of the conventional IgM, but all of them are J-chain positive. When one looks at the adult, no more than neonatal, obviously, lots of plasma cells that are being stained with the conventional IgM, about half of those are positive um, uh, for the J-chain. Now when we look at BLIMP1, which is supposed to be the master regulator, of, of um, antibody secretion, in, as you know, in, in plasma cells. What we find is that BLIMP1 doesn't stain very many cells in the, in the young animal, um, but it does stain about half of the IgM-positive cells that we see uh, in, in the adult, and those cells seem to be uh, different from the ones that are stained with the J-chain. So basic idea is you've got two types of cells. The, early 19S producers are J-chain plus, blimp minus, and in the adults, you have uh, J-chain plus, IgM plus, and blimp minus, and you have blimp plus, IgM positive. And that doesn't really fit with the typical network models that we have for um, uh, how the uh, J-chain is expressed, as well as the secretory immunoglobulin program. BLIMP is thought to shut off PAX5, which derepresses J-chain. So um, this is telling us that there must be something else going on in, in, in the model. And in fact, if it were true that, uh, that um, J-chain were expressed in such a way, you would expect J-chain to be expressed in all plasma cells of the, of the mammals. And we know that, uh, especially in the lamina propria, you have uh, cells that will produce monomeric IgA as well as dimeric IgA. 
The dimeric IgA producers are the ones that have J-chain, not the monomeric IgA. And it actually hasn't been reported in the literature, but our preliminary data would suggest that the IgG producers in the spleen don't make it either. So we think what we found in the shark with the conventional immunoglobulins may be a paradigm for telling us what's happening in the mammal, and that's what we're studying now. There's one antibody out there that recognizes the native J chain in the mouse that we got from Thomas Lay Anderson. And right now, uh, Caitlin and, and Hal are looking to see whether there's a dichotomy in the expression of J, which we totally expect, and whether uh, that blimp that dichotomy that we see as well in the shark is uh, following um, uh, the same pattern in vertebrate evolution. So the conclusions. Shark germline joined IgM, a spectacular example of a natural antibody. But the 19S expressing cells probably also form a, a lineage of B cells, we think, still to be proven. J chain may identify lineages from the earliest stages in all vertebrates. Blimp expression may also identify the cells, low to negative expression in early, early lineages. So those secretory cells are perpetuated through the life of the animal. Second set, B cells in lower vertebrates are phagocytic, also mammalian B1 cells. And then recent findings you may not be aware of. The mammalian yolk sac work that's done by Dorshkin's lab found that they not only put out primitive RBC, but the yolk sac also puts out a first wave of B1 cells, and others have recently shown a first wave of macrophages. So a real type of primitive hematopoietic system macrophages, um, uh, B1 cells, and, and RBC, and it connects this macrophage B1 lineage. Maybe that has something to do with the, the phagocytosis it's seen in B1 cells. And then mucosal immunity, so important that convergent evolution provides similar function with specialized Igs, both innate, dimeric IgA and IgT, and adaptive, monomeric IgA. And last slide, major message from this talk, B cell lineages uh, were there from the outset. Looks like you do have something like an innate cell lineage, if you let me call it B1. J chain might identify particular types. And um, we can talk over lunch how to get a further function. And Ig and gamma delta TCR are siblings. And how can we expose adaptive gamma delta TCR and gamma delta T cells in mammals and all vertebrates? And this shouldn't be so surprising to you, I guess. The fact that Ulrich von Andrian has shown that they're actually adaptive natural killer cells now. He's published papers on uh, uh, haptins as well as virus. Um, gamma deltas are gonna, are gonna come next. Thank you. So, uh, Martin, it's recently been shown that this whole concept of the layered immune system uh, can have a molecular uh, uh, component, and that is uh, LIN28B. So LIN28B is expressed in the yeah. fetal, quote, innate type cells in uh, humans and in uh, mice and not in the adult. So I guess the question is, um, could that also be a regulator, a key regulator of innate uh, type immune systems throughout uh, evolution? I think, I think that might be. We were talking about looking at that. Uh, in the work we're doing here, uh, this was all done at the plasma cell level. So we're inferring that you know, they, they've come from different lineages. But if we get into this more and more, I think uh, that would be great if it were a marker like that. Um, a quick question. Do you know with the, with the B1B cells and, and their phagocytosing this antigen, how that influences their presentation and interaction yeah. with T cells at all? It, it doesn't quite make sense, does it? <laughs> you, you take up antigen nonspecifically. I mean, B cells are supposed to be important for cognate interactions. But nevertheless, in that JLB paper, uh, Sunye showed, you know, with the OT1 system that they're capable of taking up antigen and, and presenting OVA to, to T cells. Um, physiologically, I, it's hard to understand what that means, but 
Uh, it's it's it, it, actually that's part of the title of his paper.